Good evening and welcome to the City of Monterey Transportation Adaptation Plan online workshop. We're just going to give it a few more minutes. We have had quite a few more reservations and registrations that are currently logged in, so we might just wait till 6.05 to allow the rest of the people that have uh, registered for tonight to join. Okay, good evening again. We now have most of the people that have RSVP'd. So thank you so much for joining us tonight for the City of Monterey Transportation Adaptation Plan. I just want to check that uh, everyone is able to hear and it looks like all the audio is working. So I'm going to get started. So for tonight's agenda and meeting format, what you're going to see is a short introduction to tonight's format. And then we're going to actually show a video of the presentation. We were doing this to make sure that there weren't any technical glitches or issues with audio or sharing screens or things like that. So there will be a presentation. And following that, there will be a comments and questions section. 
So my name is Joe Clayton and I work for Kimley Horn. So we are helping to consult on this really exciting and interesting project. I'm going to be managing the GoToWebinar app tonight. And so if you have any particular issues, just let me know. And you can let me know via the questions pane, which I'll show you how to use shortly. At the end of the presentation, city and project staff will be available to answer questions. I'm just letting you know that everyone's microphones will be muted during the meeting. And on top of that too, if you need to drop off for any reason, or if you need to step away, just letting you know that the meeting is being recorded and will actually be available for future viewing. So I realize that uh, many of the people who are on tonight's call, you might have been using Zoom or uh, Google Meet or Skype or Teams or many of the other conferencing and uh, video talk platforms that are around. So I just want to make sure that people are familiar with GoToWebinar Guide. So if you're using a desktop computer or a laptop, you should see a control panel which looks pretty similar to this. Now, what's particularly relevant for tonight are the meeting handouts. And so with the meeting handouts, we have a little quick guide to go to webinar that you can have a look at. And on top of that too, a really great handout which explains how to use the interactive map and the survey monkey, which we'll be showing you later on tonight. So feel free to click on those and download them and take a look at them either tonight or during your own time. In terms of being able to participate tonight, as I was saying before, all the microphones will be muted, but you'll still be able to submit a comment or question through the questions pane. And so just going back one screen, that's the questions pane right there, the, uh, the meeting handout section. Okay. And so just confirming that everyone can see the meeting handouts and the ask a question pane. Later on, you can use the map and complete the survey. So the link will be distributed and published, and it's also available in the handout section that I was talking about a little bit earlier. So I strongly recommend that if you have a really good question or piece of feedback that you consider also submitting it by the survey in case we're not able to answer it tonight. For tonight's meeting, we have Kimberly Cole, who's the Community Development Director for the City of Monterey, and Fernanda Ribery, who's a Senior Associate Planner with the City of Monterey. On top of that too, to answer any transport questions is Frederick Venter from Kimley Horn, and any questions on sea level adaptation, Rebecca Verity from GEI is also available. So for tonight's meeting, Frederick and Rebecca will be covering the project purpose, the sea level rise projections, exploring the consequences, exploring the solutions, and explaining why it's really important that you get your, to have your say in this important project. So at this point, I'm actually going to hand over and put on the video presentation. A very warm welcome to all of you and thank you for attending our virtual workshop. Uh, this workshop is about the City of Monterey Transportation Adaptation Plan. Um, presenting with me tonight um, is um, Rebecca Verity with GEI Consultants. She's our sea level rise expert. My name is Frederick Venter and I'm with Kim Horn and Associates. Tonight we will cover the project purpose, um, we talk a little bit about the, the threat of sea level rise in Monterey and what could happen to the transportation infrastructure. We're going to look a little bit at the forecasting of sea level rise and, and, and what we foresee in the future. And then specifically look at the consequences and um, explore solutions um, to help protect you 
against um, sea level rise or how do we manage it. Um, most important is your input tonight is going to be extremely important. Um, we really want to see how do we keep Monterey moving in the face of sea level rise. So the way the project works, it's set up like this. We've taken the data from previous studies to review what the flood and erosion zones will look like in the future. From that, we've identified citywide risks, not just to transportation, but to the, the city as a whole. And you'll be able to weigh in during a survey on which of those risks are important to you. Then we've identified a suite of options for solutions. And again, you'll be able to uh, identify on the survey which ones appeal to you and, and explore them in detail on some maps. Um, tonight, we're here to gather your input, which as Frederick just mentioned, is a critically important portion of this project. Um, and then finally, we're going to use your input to narrow down those adaptation options from more than 23, depending on how you count, down to three option packages for the city to move forward and consider in the future. So let's start by just a quick review of what those current flood predictions say uh, is, is coming up for Monterey. This slide uh, shows FEMA flood zones, and these were redone in 2018, um, with sea levels at the height they are now. So here in, you'll see the area that would flood in the city should a large storm hit tomorrow, uh, a storm that has a, a chance of recurring about once every 100 years. And in dark gray, is a larger flood area that would occur with a larger flood, one that occurs perhaps once every 500 years. Something I do want to share, though, is that FEMA flood projections are based on what historical floods have done. And I think we've all seen that across the country, large storms are really changing. They're increasing in frequency and also in intensity. So for instance, uh, certain areas in Texas um, including Houston, have seen multiple thousand year floods just in the past five years. So these events have been rare in the past. They may be less rare in the future. Up here in orange, you'll see an area that is not uh, currently expected to flood, but would be in, if affected by large storms. So let's look at future flooding. Here in light blue, you'll see the areas that would flood with less than a foot of flooding, 0.7 feet of flooding. And this is the area that is projected to flood uh, just 10 years from now. So mostly just around the edges of existing lakes, but critically across Del Monte Avenue, which cuts off a major transportation route for your city. Moving forward to uh, 2.4 feet of flooding. This is projected by mid-century, maybe 2060, depending on how fast seas rise. I'm going to go back and forth so you can see the light blue of 2030 and then a different shade of blue again for uh, 2060. So larger areas of the city flooding, small residential areas as well. And then end of century, 5.2 feet of flooding. Um, and this is the light green and here we've got uh, the intersection with Highway 1 intersected in much larger residential areas of the city. So let's talk about what that looks like in a different way. Um, right now, uh, mean high, high water is sort of the daily high tide level, the average daily high tide in Monterey, and it's 5.4 feet in elevation above sea level, what we think of as zero. And once a month, your tides get, on average, up to 6.5 feet above sea level. So if we look at those numbers I just talked about, this is the predicted monthly high water elevation in Monterey in the future. So now uh, water is reaching to 6.5 feet by end of century, closer to 11.5 feet, or your day or monthly high tides, or your area that, that essentially is ocean. 
So what that uh, does in terms of impacts, here's some examples. Uh, by 2030, here's your, your tide levels, parts of Del Monte Avenue permanently lost. Uh, the tides completely swamp the road to the tunnel by 2060, um, though the tunnel may be vulnerable long before then to waves. Um, when we add in those FEMA large storms, that FEMA 100 year storm, right now with current sea levels, a 100 year storm would swamp the deck at Municipal Wharf 2. That same size storm, a 100 year storm, uh, would reach Cannery Row, the elevation of the street at the aquarium by mid-century is what's predicted. So you can explore these flood levels yourself. You can zoom in, you can get really close to properties that are of particular interest to you on an online map that we've prepared uh, for the city that's accessible to the public. We'll give you that address at the end of this presentation and you'll see this control bar on the side of it and you can just turn on and off different levels of flooding and see uh, which areas are, are going to be impacted. So Frederick's going to talk about the consequences uh, to the city and also very specifically to traffic if we do nothing uh, to prepare for sea level rise. So I think you will recall this picture back from um, a few years ago when Del Monte flooded. Um, this was temporary flooding during a storm. It resided um, or receded rather and um, and uh, eventually these will happen more and more and will result in permanent land loss. The next um, is that after the flooding happened, we see um, the, the waves that Rebecca spoke about. So with increased waves, we see um, increased erosion of the beachfront. Um, and also eventually that erosion will happen for the Monterey Bay Scenic Trail as well. Um, and we'll see increased wave impacts. Um, that will result in this kind of erosion where the beach had to be um, resanded again. There is also a sort of a hidden damage that we don't see until it actually happens. And that's when the oceans backflow through our stormwater drains in our sewers um, underneath the roads. And this is a picture of San Francisco a couple of years ago where the damage caused by this kind of flooding was well uh, in excess of $5 million. We're now going to look at some volumes and looking specifically, you know, what would happen with traffic, um, you know, as we see the flooding occur. So this slide shows us um, 2040 daily volumes that would occur on the city street. The, the first one I want you to notice is actually the Almonte Avenue, um, where we see about 46,000 cars a day, it's a substantial amount of cars, and then also specifically the Lighthouse Tunnel, where it increases to 57,000 cars a day. Now, these are the two biggest road um, sections that will be impacted. If we look at Pearl and Fremont, um, Pearl almost has no traffic because it's really local serving right now. Fremont, about 30,000 cars a day. So on the next slide, we're going to now see what happens if we start losing the roads. Uh, the first one is with a 0.7 feet sea level rise, about 2030 conditions, and we lose Del Monte Avenue and the Lighthouse Tunnel. Um, so that's 57,000 cars through the tunnel needs to go elsewhere, or where do they go? Part of it, the biggest shift is to Pearl and also to Fremont Street. But this traffic also shifts elsewhere in the city. So if we look at where those occur, of course, the way to get around is once the traffic uh, gets pushed elsewhere, it goes through downtown. So we can see an increase on Pacific and then cars want to take the back road, um, which is then up David and Prescott. Um, and eventually it pushed down to um, Highway 68, where we see an increase in volumes as well. And then I want you to look at the, some of the negatives here, specifically that there's an overall decrease that starts to happen in cars coming into the city. Um, on the, on, that's on the right-hand side of the screen. And then you can see the substantial decrease in volumes on Lighthouse and on Foam Street as well. Next, we move into what happens if we have 2.4 feet of sea level rise, and that's about mid-century. So now Del Monte floods, the tunnel floods, and also Pearl floods. Um, we need to get rid of more vehicles or more vehicles in the system needs to relocate and find other routes to get into the city. Um, we're now going to look at where some of those increases happen. 
Um, so on the next slide, um, the first one is again, where are the gaps right now? So we saw it going to Fremont Street, um, a bigger increase through downtown, and then of course, all the back route along David, Prescott and Highway 68. <clears throat> on the next slide, you will see how the negatives actually increase, um, especially the ones on the left-hand side that more and more people cannot get to the city. Um, so, so we see that net loss of traffic coming into, into Monterey. The following slide is in 2100 conditions where we lose all three roads. So you will remember that from the maps that Rebecca showed, Fremont floods, Pearl floods, Delmoni and Batamo floods. So this is where we start seeing total gridlock in the system. Um, you know, if we look at where all the increases are now, and they are substantial on the next slide, is, you know, David and Prescott, they are way over their capacity in terms of they can carry. Look how the volumes go and increase on through downtown. And also now we see substantial pushes through uh, next to the Del Monte Center uh, along Monras. And then also Highway 68. Quite substantially here is also now the loss in traffic that uh, cannot get into the city at all. So we see uh, reductions, especially on the east side. And then of course, on the west side, lighthouse and foam will be very quiet streets. So on the next slide, we're going to look at uh, a better story of what happens um, at specific locations. Now, this one shows you the uh, how volumes change from the base here through the three um, sea level rise scenarios. And this is specifically um, at Highway 68, uh, just past the um, Trump Hospital. So you can see we have about 18,000 cars a day in 2040 conditions how it increases to about 25 and still tries to increase to about 27,000 um, cars a day by when we see the 5.2 feet sea level rise. The next slide shows you if we do the same sort of uh, graphic and we look at the locations on Del Monte and on, um, on specifically Highway 1 at Agohiro and also on Mark Thomas Drive. So you can see Del Monte closure, um, you know how the volumes go down. Um, significantly. Highway 1 at Aguajiro goes up significantly and then on Mark Thomas is where you can see that it goes up, up and eventually it goes down and that going down in 5.2 feet sea level rise is because of that vehicles are just now sort of leaving the city because they cannot get into the city. So in the next slide, you know, what, what does this do for us, right? Um, if we don't take any action on sea level rise, public safety is at risk. Um, fire cannot respond, EMRs cannot respond um, in a timely fashion. How do they get around if they're on the east side and you got to get to the west side? You know, do you get around? It's going to be congested. <clears throat> also, there will be big impacts on tourism and businesses that will decline. Um, we saw the reduction in traffic on those slides. Um, how do people actually get to the hotels? How do they come and enjoy the scenic and great lifestyle and the aquarium uh, in, in, in the city of Monterey? And re residents will be displaced. Um, and then ultimately, you know, the mobility and our daily activities will be severely disrupted. So, we have crafted a range of options for solutions, and we just want to emphasize once again, your input matters, um, and we want to make sure you, you're you fully informed. Uh, so we're going to talk about sort of two overarching strategies with, with subcategories of options under each. And the first strategy is coastal flood protection. So here in this picture, you can see existing sea level is light blue and these buildings are up above it. Uh, but future sea level in dark blue, they're not above that. These low lying houses or businesses uh, could be protected by a seawall, a dike, a levee, a number of different options. Um, but then they will exist below sea level. So the option to that is something called managed retreat. Um, which is where we literally just let the sea take what it's going to take, or at least a portion of that, um, and move, uh, move our people out of the risk zone. And actually, Monterey is a great candidate for this, because if you look at those flood maps, 
a lot of what floods is already lake and the land areas that are flooding are not a huge portion of the total geography of the city because you've got those lovely steep hills rising up. Um, so managed retreat becomes possible while maintaining uh, the, the city in a way that, that we love living in it, which is not true for some low-lying cities. So each of these options, as I said, you'll be able to explore online, starting with the flood protection. So when you go to that online map, uh, look over here on the left and click that box for flood protection. And there's there's different portions of the city that uh, are represented. You can see these highlighted areas. That doesn't tell you a lot. So if you click again on any of the individual details, it will pull up some sort of illustration of what that option would be and a description with the, the pros and the cons of each of those options. And at each area in the city that's going to flood, we've presented you with uh, more than one option. So 15 total options there to explore on the maps and then rate on the surveys. The benefits of flood protection are we maintain existing land uses without disruption. The concerns, however, are significant. Flood protection is very costly to build, and it's also costly to maintain. The thing we need to understand about sea level rise is it's going to go on for the foreseeable future, not just the end of century, but four centuries beyond that. So if we build walls or levees that would protect us to 2100, at some point we will need to raise those walls. Uh, and we also need to add an extra uh, safety lever there because of, of large storms and waves. Draining the city uh, grows increasingly more difficult and more expensive. Frederick talked about how the ocean can actually flow backwards up through our storm drains as seas rise and uh, groundwater will rise sewage discharge will be impacted. And so there's a lot of costs with changing the drainage uh, infrastructure in the city so that when rain falls, we can still have dry streets and dry homes. Um, and then of course there's safety concerns for anyone who's living or working below future sea levels. We know there are areas around the world um, such as Amsterdam that have lived below sea level successfully for many, many years. Uh, New Orleans um, lived below sea level, portions of it successfully until Hurricane Katrina. Um, I don't know of any city that has successfully lived below sea level protected by walls or dikes that is in a seismically active zone. So there's an added element of engineering for those flood protections that would require uh, them to be earthquake safe as well. And that's an untested thing. We've, we've not done that before. So the alternative uh, is managed, carefully managed retreat. So we're back looking at this flood map. Uh, and if we imagine that these flooded areas just are ocean or at least some portion of them, um, here are the specific roads in blue that would need to be adjusted so that we don't have the, the total gridlock that Frederick uh, was talking about. So you click on the manage retreat transportation options here on the right. And uh, each of those will, will pull up a description again with the pros and, pros and cons. So putting reversible lanes on Pearl Street allows traffic to flow more freely during uh, rush hour or up on Del Monte, we could we could get crazy and convert that to a really beautiful viaduct um, or a bridge type situation. It could be for pedestrians or for for automobiles, uh, and each of those options are explorable with their with their pros and their cons. This is not uh, completely pie in the sky or crazy. We haven't made up uh, the idea of managed retreat. In fact, FEMA has been funding managed retreat uh, since the 1980s. And these little black dots show you every uh, 
voluntary FEMA property buyout because of repeat flooding since 1989. There's been many, many thousands of these around the country and down along the Gulf Coast and up along the Northeast Coast. A lot of that repeat flooding is coastal surge um, combined with sea level rise. So what happens if we if we were to consider managed retreat is that at-risk land would be bought from willing owners and very gradually as seas gradually rise converted to open space and water uh, we would have to adjust traffic we would have to put in temporary flood protection to make sure that storm floods uh, don't do much damage as we we gradually adjust and then the managed retreat concerns it could mean saying no to new development in certain low-lying areas of the city or along Cannery Row requiring higher flood protection and, and storm wave uh, protection, um, or requiring property owners to plan to remove properties as seas rise in those risky areas. We have to figure out how we fund buyouts just as we would have to figure out how we fund flood protection. And in the past, there's been money from FEMA and from the state to, to do both of those things. There's the question of what if sellers aren't willing. Um, and then there's how do we, uh, how would Monterey look after we, we did this? And all of those uh, can be explored in the surveys and in the maps that I've talked about. So once more, this is just how to use those online interactive maps. I've already demonstrated and showed it to you, but so you have it here, you can explore uh, both the flood predictions and the solutions by turning flood layers on and off, turning flood protection layers on and off, turning transportation solutions on and off, and then clicking on each of those options to get more detail. So we hope we'll do, you'll do that. Spend a little time with those maps uh, and those options before you take the survey so you really feel like you, you know what those options are. Because we need your help. We do believe that working together, we can keep people and infrastructure safe. We can keep Monterey moving. We can work with rising seas rather than against them and sustain our coastal future. Imagine how Monterey could be. Thank you, Frederick and Rebecca. At this point, I'm actually going to ask Frederick and Rebecca to join me in sharing their webcams again for the question and answer section of tonight. So hopefully you can now see me. And Rebecca and Frederick should be joining us momentarily. There Frederick is. Thank you for joining us again. So we received a few questions via the questions pane during the presentation, and thank you to the people that submitted them. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out those questions, um, summarize them and read them out and ask Frederick and Rebecca to provide a response if possible. What's also really important to remember is that if we're not able to answer it tonight, hopefully we can respond to you or get back to you sometime in the next week or so with a response because some of you might have some particularly specific questions. So just reminding you to use the questions pane that you should be able to see on this screen. So our first question is to Rebecca and it's just a check from a member of the audience who wanted to get a little bit more detail on the city limit lines. Uh, as they saw it, the limit lines might not have been properly uh, prepared on that map. Apparently the city limit lines extend into the ocean.
Rebecca, you're currently muted. If you've been responding. Yes. Uh, thank you for your question, and Mr. You're Reeves. Um, still muted. It says that I am. Can you hear yeah. me now? We can hear you okay. now. Okay. I've I've been trying to thank Mr. Reeves for his questions. Um, I'm not sure which map um, is being referred to with the city limit lines, um, but uh, Joe, are you? Are you pulling up a map? It's, it looks to be uh, perhaps on slide 11. Um, okay, I'll just, sorry for the uh, quick scrolling folks. Yeah, sorry, I I'm, I'm, might want to pass on this, on this question and, and answer it offline because I don't believe that we put in political boundaries on these lines or, or we did not intend to do so. Um, we we meant to show simply an aerial a satellite view um, with the the overlay to make it clear where flood waters would be. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, on slide fourteen, and I'm just this I'm just wondering whether or not some of these questions refer to the. Uh, the plan itself because they are saying page. So if you're the person that asked those questions, if you don't mind just getting back in touch with us to confirm some of the page numbers that you're referencing, we'll come back to that later. Um, Frederick, we've had a question about the primary mode of sand transport along the shore. So there's a question about uh, some of the people involved in the Southern Monterey Bay Coastal Erosion Work Group said that sand is primarily transported transversely to the shore, that is on and off shore. So which is it? If it is along the shore, would groins be an option to slow erosion? Um, so, so for the sand, um, right now we looked at sea level rise, right? And the sea level rise will erode with wave action and also with the actual increase in, in sea level height. Um, you know, and then we look at how that impacts the land. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know if Rebecca wants to respond to if we import more sand that could potentially um, help delay or prevent um, ocean or sea level rise or storm surge. Sure. Um, Joe, could you take us please to a slide? Let me see. Um, slide number 63. Shelving. Uh, no, of the this is twenty two. Sorry, say that again. There we go. Okay. Um. So one of the one of the options that we've we've talked about, um, or that we've included in the options you can explore online and rate, is um, what's sometimes called an ecotone levy. Um, which is wider than a typical levee and includes uh, habitat, um, plantings, et cetera. And you'll see in this illustration, uh, we also included some berms uh, that are meant to catch and retain sand. Beach enhancement on its own at current elevations of the beach would not be expected to be adequate to hold back um, mid-century to late century levels of sea level rise. Um, if you go now, please, uh, Joe, to slide 12. It's sure, there might just be a quick flash and a little hold. Uh, there we go. Um, I don't know if you can see, but if you look, uh, right down along where Del Monte Avenue first floods, where little bits of blue are first crossing Del Monte. We're talking about very, very small areas of Del Monte that flood on their own without any storm waves. This is a very calm day. There's no wave action at all. Tiny areas of Del Monte are flooding by 2030 at protected levels. Could 
raising the dunes via beach enhancement protect against that level of flooding, there's a stronger likelihood. In the near term, just some beach enhancement could, could buy some time. Um, it would need to be checked for engineering and the city also needs to consider what level of storm they want to protect against. Because as I said, this is no storm at all. This is flat calm water. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we've had a clarification that some of the questions about specific page numbers uh, refers to the study document itself, not the slides. So we might have to take those questions on notice and come back to you. Thank you. So we've had a question about one of the main primary problems in the area is that uh, sea level rises, sorry, is that as sea level rises, rainwater will not be able to flow by gravity into the ocean at certain times. So the berming has been, that has been done for many years, addresses only the wave run up, but it doesn't address longer term as in many minutes or hours episodes of elevated sea level rise. That's exactly right. Um, and it also doesn't address the, the pooling that will happen as rain flows down from the hills and collects. Um, currently, the rain flows out through storm drains um, and you may get a, a slight rise in water in the three lakes in the downtown area. Um, but as seas rise, that, that rainwater will not be able to flow by gravity. Um, and any sewer flow, flow that goes by gravity could also be impeded. Um, and we, we have not done those, those specific studies. Um, it would be a recommended next step for the city, but in every single one of the flood protection options, you will see that under, uh, there's, there's a bullet that says, so if you just go to the map, can you go to the map online, Joe? The Google map one, uh, yep. I can bring it up if you... not, let me, that's okay. Let me, let me figure out what slide I can go to. Uh, just go please to slide number, uh, 32. Okay. I now have it up. So if you just give me one minute. The map? Okay. Um, in every single flood protection option, we note that if we choose flood protection, drainage throughout the city will need to be improved. And so we've got specific slides for that. So Joe, if you could just click on, on flood protection 1B. Uh, flood protection 1B. Where am I clicking? I'm sorry. Uh, you've scrolled down, uh, go back up. Oh, yeah. Sorry, my apologies. There we go. Okay. Um, under concerns or notes, this is, this is hard to see on my screen. My eyes are not good enough. Um, I can read it out if you like. <laughs> no, that's okay, actually. Um, we, we actually may not have, I may have caught myself out in an error here and it will need to be added. But for every flood protection option, there should be a bullet, bullet point that says under concerns and notes, drainage needs to be improved. And we have specific slides on here that, that demonstrate. So go back out of 1B, please. Um, so click that little white arrow in the red bar, Joe. Thank you. Um, and then uh, click on 2A at Del Monte Lake. Yep. And click on the picture of that duck bill, please. That storm drainy looking thing. Just here? Yep. Uh, no, the, the photograph? No, nope, uh, go back. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Go to 2A. Yep. And click on the photograph. Okay. So this is a device that stops the ocean from flowing backwards into the lakes when the lakes are lower than the ocean. It's called the duckbill valve. There are many other types of devices that, that keep that from happening. So this uh, just does that. And then 
Joe, just to the right, there's a little forward white arrow that will take you to the next photo, just to the right of the duck bill photo. Just give me one sec. There you there. go. Yep. And now here is an illustration that shows in the before, we've got flooded streets. Um, and in the after, with improved drainage and backflow prevention, rainwater retention, and a new pump station, those are the types of things that would be needed to drain the city either from rainwater or collected seawater um, under a flood protection scenario. So those would be needed no matter what we do. Okay, I'm going to switch back to the presentation at this point. And go to the next question, which is, uh, what transportation model are you using? Are you estimating changes in VMT and VHT across the network? And so Frederick, that question is for you. Thank you, Joe. So um, we have updated um, the, uh, the, the travel demand model for the region with um, some information with uh, city uh, forecasting, and it is the 2040 horizon year. Um, at this stage, um, you know, all we're doing is looking at the diversion of traffic. Um, so we basically looked at if a road is eliminated off the network, um, you know, then reassignment happens on the model and it forecasts where the trips would go. Um, we did not um, estimate um, congestion, VMT or vehicle hours traveled. Um, in the slides that we've shown you, there were substantial increases of on some roads, 60%, um, you know, some of the, the local city uh, downtown streets, were well over 100%. Um, um, you know, the, the, the assessment of that increase in traffic is that there will be um, congestion occurring on several of the roads. Um, <clears throat> the more roads, so in, 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 in a later scenario where we lose Del Monte, and Pearl and Fremont. Um, basically, we turn into gridlock on the system. Um, there are the vehicles will want to go on all the local neighborhood streets as well to find their way. And as the um, and the model clearly shows for us that there is just no capacity in the system to to accommodate all the traffic that um, you know enters the city on a daily basis. Um, um, so yeah, so that that's the analysis that we've shown here. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, the next question is also for you, Frederick. Um, regarding locating or reconstructing these major roadways, this could take decades of planning, environmental reviews, public input, etc. If we do follow managed retreat, where will the traffic that travels Del Monte Avenue be moved to? If we don't want armored shorelines, where will Highway 1 be removed to? Absolutely great question. <clears throat> so, so if Del Monte floods, right, what we see is that the traffic will um, firstly shift to Pearl Street. So, you know, um, uh, that's the, the next option over for the trips into, into the city and also heading to Canary Row and, and Pacific Grove, um, you know, and also uh, up to Fremont Street. And then we do see Highway 68, the next the road into the city. Um, you know, um, there's also um, access past the Del Monte shopping center uh, where traffic is also diverted to. So, so immediately the model, what, what, what we see in the modeling is that we have origins and destinations, right? And what the model says is, and people live in one location and they work in another and that's their travel need. And so the model will look for an alternative route um, to assign traffic to. So that, that's what we see. Regarding Highway 1, um, you know, we, um, I think Caltrans is currently working with the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, um, looking at some resiliency plans for Highway 1. Um, there's, I haven't seen anything out yet on, on this bit of Highway 1 uh, towards the uh, city of Monterey. Um, but they will also follow typical approaches of, um, you know, receding, um, uh, sorry, not receding, of, of retreating. Um, you know, so if let's say they say, well, we don't want to keep Highway 1, 
and then the traffic needs to go elsewhere, right? So I think from the flood maps that we um, see here is uh, you know, the scary part is that Del Monte and Fremont also gets flooded. So you know the next sort of option is really General Jumur Boulevard. Um, if you allow for full retreat, um, the the other option is again of uh, doing an elevated um, highway one. So just raising the the four lanes, and that would be similar to the viaduct picture that we saw um, illustrated for Del Monte Avenue. Thank you so much. Uh, Rebecca, the next question is for you. Um, the question is regarding where would the funding come from to do eminent domain or to acquire private properties that might need to be condemned or removed as part of this project? Thank you for the question. I think the first and most important thing to say is that uh, this study is not looking at eminent domain. Um, it's not one of the options. Where we're looking at managed retreat, uh, it would be willing sellers. Um, either managed retreat or flood protection will cost billions of dollars. There's, there's no question at all about that. Um, maybe not in the immediate future, but over the long term. However, uh, the costs of not responding to sea level rise um, are expected to be significantly larger than the costs of responding. We've seen this again and again with the large floods and the large hurricanes that, that we get on the Gulf Coast and the East Coast. Um, areas that did plan ahead and that were able to um, adapt prior to significant storm events saw um, different estimates, uh, but a nine to one, um, nine to one damage to costs spent to avoid damage. When we look at the damage to New York for, from Hurricane Sandy, we were looking at $60 billion of damage to New York. Um, the state had previously backburnered something on the order of, of $3 billion to protect the city for the same size of storm. And they chose not to do it at that time. And instead of spending $3 billion, they, they lost 60. So there's nothing that's cheap. Uh, or inexpensive in the long term. In the short term, as I talked about, with those small areas of Del Monte at risk in the next 10 years, there are absolutely some less expensive options to consider as we raise money, as we apply for grants, as we find ways to move forward. Thank you so much. The next question, Frederick, is for you. Actually, Oops. Joe. Um, sure. I, I wanted to see if, if um, Kim might want to jump in and, and just also speak to the question of eminent domain or anything along those lines. Add to what I've said. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Can you hear me? We can. Everyone? Great. Yeah. Um, Kimberly Cole, I'm the Community Development Director for the City of Monterey. Um, our current municipal code actually prohibits eminent domain. Um, so not only would it, it's not proposed in the plan, um, it's legislatively right now prohibited in our municipal code. And we have no plans at this point to pursue eminent domain. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question, Frederick, is for you. So how are numbers of cars projected was it done to, using current numbers and were mass transit projects include future mass transit projects included in the calculations? Thank you, Joe. Great question. So, so the numbers that we showed you is based on basically um, some uh, passenger car travel on a daily basis, right? Um, um, we did not show any solutions. This is basically an impact uh, to the status quo, um, you know, for uh, 2040 conditions. Um, 
if you go into the to, to the survey monkey that uh, that asks you a lot of questions one of the options are definitely to have a greatly improvement or a great improvement to transit service um, into Monterey. Um, obviously one can think that if you cannot get the, the, the you know 100 or 60 cars in right at least you can get one bus in so so that's one of the options that we have to talk about the modeling does not include or take into consideration um, transit services the regional model has a transit component in it uh, for transit ridership um, it is actually fairly low um, you know, we're probably talking here around five percent um, yeah so those are the results Thank you, Frederick. Uh, Rebecca, I'm hoping you might be able to answer this one. It's a great question. Um, one of the members in the audience is keen to know how the wharves and piers can be protected. Uh, that is a, a, a great question. And the risk to the wharves and piers is, is uh, not identical for each one. Um, Let's see, I wanna, I wanna ask Joe to bring up a slide here because I wanna show you um, a really great resource for those who are interested. Um, I'm just flipping through. Joe, can I have page 49, please? Okay, so, Moffat and Nickel uh, is, is a really excellent consulting firm that did a wave damage study that was finished in, in May of last year, um, building on the work that Ravel Coastal did to look at, at sea level rise base layers. And, and those are the two studies that our work on adaptation is being built on. Um, there are a, about 20 pages, I might have that count wrong, in the Moffat and Nickel report, this one is page 40 uh, down page, I can't read that page number right there. Um, 28. Page 28 of their report tells you exactly what the damage would ex be expected to be uh, with a hundred year storm or that storm that has a, a one in a hundred chance of happening any particular year. Um, with no sea level rise and at the three levels of sea level rise that we're considering. And it details what what waves would, what wave damage would occur to each of the piers. Uh, this page that I'm showing you is Old Fisherman's Wharf. Um, Joe flipped to the next page. Uh, Municipal Wharf 2, it's got the Coast Guard beer, pier and so down here, oh, you can't see what my mouse is doing. Down at the bottom, there's a little item that says for adaptation. And that tells you what some of their ideas are for actually um, protecting uh, the wharves, adding resilience to the wharves and the piers. The purpose of this particular study that we're talking about tonight is uh, road transportation, unfortunately, not um, sea transportation. So we didn't include specific adaptation measures for each of these, uh, but we do talk just a little bit about how we would connect the wharves and piers to existing transportation networks. And so that can be explored when you're exploring all the adaptation answers in the online maps. But I, I really would encourage you to read these specific pages of the Moffat and Nickel report because they give really clear language about which areas are more vulnerable to waves now, which have more time and, and what some of those adaptation options could be. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, I think Kimberly might need to come in on this next question. So a member of the audience would like to know, is there a countywide study also being done what the level of coordination is between the city and adjacent communities? That's a good question. Um, I'm not aware of a regional study that's currently being done for sea level rise in the area. Um, Pacific Grove, our adjacent city, did incorporate sea, sea level rise into their local coastal plan update 
and have a series of strategies uh, in that plan. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, I'm not aware that Sand City or Seaside or our adjacent communities or Monterey County are conducting a sea level rise study. Great, thank you so much. Joe, if I may, uh, the state of California has done statewide studies. Um, their estimations of how fast seas will rise are a little bit higher than the ones in, in this study. And how fast seas rise does vary along the coastline for a number of technical reasons I won't get into. Um, so the statewide study um, says seas will rise a little faster than, than our studies have. Um, there's a lot of good information if you, if you look for those. And some other communities along Monterey Bay have also done a number of studies and planning projects, not specifically, I, I, with Kim, I, I don't know of any um, next door to Monterey, but I know that Santa Cruz and some of the communities sort of north have also done a lot of work that's worth looking at. You know, I should add one one comment to that. We actually started in 2008 regionally looking at the southern Monterey Bay, and there was a study um, completed by um, NOAA, and Dr. Revel helped with that study, looking at erosion mitigation alternatives for the entire southern Monterey Bay from the Salinas River towards Wharf 2. So we really started looking at that in 2008. When we started looking at that, it didn't really account for sea level rise. So there is a, a two-part study, a very good foundational study looking at um, various ocean processes and different information from Wharf 2 to um, the Salinas River, but it does not address sea level rise. Hey, and Joe, um, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments has a draft study report out right now. Um, if you go to their website on ambag.org, um, it's called the Central Coast Highway 1 Climate Resiliency Study. Um, so they specifically talk um, about Highway 1. Um, so if you want to look at that, there's a good resource as well for regional travel. And a member of the audience has uh, reminded us that the city of Moreno has done sea level rise planning focused on managed retreat. So <laughs> talk a village, but uh, I think we got some great answers there on that one. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we've got another question from the audience, Frederick, asking whether or not light rail is still being considered along the recreational trail. And if so, would that be impacted as well? Um, <clears throat> so, so light rail is, um, you know, we, we don't have it discussed anywhere, but, um, you know, the tracks are still there and I, uh, you know, I, I don't think it is being considered um, currently and Kim can chime in on that one, but, you know, it runs um, sort of alongside and on top of the Monterey Bay City Trail. So, you know, if, um, if, if, if the Almani floods, the, 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 the trail floods and of course the trail tracks flood as well, um, I guess the question is if, you know, if that's one of the mass transit systems that we're thinking of, you know, and, and, and the viaduct is built, you know, do you put the, uh, the light rail system on top of the viaduct as a mass um, people mover to getting them into the city? Um, again, the uh, on the Survey Monkey um, for the for the online survey that you have to fill out. Um, you know, these are exactly sort of um, suggestions that we're looking for um, in, in in getting some responses from you. Thanks, Frederick. Uh, we've had a question just clarifying um, that we mean storm drains as opposed to sewers um, when we talk about sewer flows. And so I just wanted to confirm that we are talking about storm drains uh, for this project. Actually, both. Um, sanitary sewers uh, or you know, what happens from the pipes in your house down to a treatment system um, can also be, be vulnerable. They can be vulnerable um, in a variety of ways. There are some uh, sewer lines that run adjacent to the coastline in areas that are uh, significant erosion risks. Currently, we learned this from 
from speaking with city public works um, in an earlier workshop we did with city staff to, to, to look at the maps and say, okay, if, if this flood happens, what concern does that raise for you? And we had public works there and we had uh, the fire department and the police department uh, and, and various other departments represented so that we could hear from all the staff about their concerns. Um, and the sanitary sewers were a concern. Um, so both erosion damage to those pipes and, and manhole inf infiltration. And then storm drains are, uh, that's just the water that falls on the street from the rain and a different set of pipes usually drains those straight out to the ocean. Um, sometimes uh, through pumps, if there's a very low lying area, but I believe currently all storm drains in Monterey are actually gravity flow. Um, so those would need to become pumped in the future. I think I think it's important to understand that um, you know in our street system, quite often you know the the sewer lines and the stormwater lines uh, run close to each other or in a sort of a uh, in the same area. So if if the stormwater line breaks, the sewer line typically breaks as well. We saw the the picture of the of the sinkhole, right? So so through that, the the entire utility system actually gets damaged. And so that's why you can also have the backflow on sewer. Good point. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Frederick. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, so currently, that's all the questions that we've received tonight. Uh, I just thought we'd give it a couple more minutes to let members of the audience ask any additional questions. And just reminding you that you can submit questions via the questions pane, or you can hold off and give your feedback via the Survey Monkey. If we don't have questions coming in, um, I'd love to just give a quick overview of how to use those online maps. Sure. So if you could go back to the online map. Sure thing. And maybe we can show this as, as questions come in. Just give me a minute to switch the sharing screen. Sure. And we really recommend you take your time and explore those maps while you're while you have the survey open, you can go back and forth to the maps um, because we weren't, there's, there's so much information, it would be overwhelming to have it all in a single webinar. Um, Joe, could you turn toggle off all of the red boxes that say flood protection? Turn those off. Leave that one. <laughs> Yep. And turn Sorry. off everything. All the ones that say flood protection. My apologies. Sorry. That's okay. Okay. Uh, so you're seeing some highlighted areas disappearing now. Keep and keep going down. Get rid of managed retreat too. There you go. Now we've got nothing on here but flooding, and I want you to to just feel like you can zoom way in. So so Joe, do some zooming. Um, find a particular property that's that's of interest to you um so you can get it a more detailed look about what areas would flood when and joe can you turn off 5.2 and 2.4 so turn off the deeper floods on the on the on the left hand pane uh the deeper ones have been turned off there you go good sorry it was slow to respond to me okay so zoom back out a little bit so we can see uh yeah that's about good okay Ooh, that's way too zoomed um and let's just turn on uh flood protection at el Estero, please flood protection at el Estero. okay now here a bunch of what looks like messy highlighter shows up. This is to show you the approximate locations. It's really important to understand. We are very high level, um, approximate. This is not engineering studies yet. Um, and then each of these are a different color. And if you go to the left-hand pane and click on the names of any of them, so go ahead, Joe. Now you get your, your control panel changes to a description and up at the top, there's an illustration. If you click on that illustration, 
you can see, oh, okay, that's where they're talking about that yellow line says where they would put the levy. And then you click that forward arrow. Oh, okay, so here's the before. Um, there's some dunes there now, but the, the ocean's gonna cross those dunes. And if we raise the dunes in something that's called a narrow levy, uh, that's an option to keep us dry for flood protection. And then click again. And now we've got the, what I call the ecotone levy or a wider, more natural levy. So either a narrow levy or an ecotone levy would be options. Each of them have different pros and cons, but they could go in that location that the first image showed you. So as you go through each of these areas, now back out of 3A, there you go, and turn on 3B. Yep. Now, uh, nope, go, go back a little bit. Go, yep, don't click on those images yet. I just wanna talk about this. 3B is the thin purple line that runs, um, it actually should be moved up along La Playa Street instead of along, um, no, no, it's right. It's on the coastal trail. It's exactly where it should be. This is if the residents of La Playa say, you know what? If you're gonna build a levee, we won't have sea views. Our insurance costs are gonna go through the roof because now we're in a floodplain where we weren't before. We'd rather move. If that's the choice the La Playa residents make, then the city has the option to build the flood protection along the coastal trail instead of out where the current beach is. And so then if you click on that image at the top, uh, this is what that could eventually look like. And then keep clicking forward through those images. And again, you've got, um, so here's a narrow seawall instead of a levee and then click forward again. Um, and here's a wider seawall and it, there's some costs and, and minuses of each of those as well. So just wanna show you, that's how the online maps work. And Joe, I'm gonna turn it back to you, see if any other questions have come in. Uh, so far, no additional questions. Hopefully everyone is finding it possible to access it. On top of that too, just reminding everyone that the handout that you can find in the handouts pane, uh, that has the link to the survey and the map. And so just have a look at that handout because it can also show you how to use it, um, both the survey and the map. So just reminding about that. Um, does anyone have any questions? Getting lots of great questions just before, so. or any technical questions such as about the map or the survey. Joe, this is Fernanda. Hi, Fernanda. Maybe, maybe um, could we put up that inter interactive map and survey PDF? Could we show it on the screen? Because for people watching on TV, they may want to write down the survey link. Sure, just okay. give me one minute. Okay. Okay. So here we go. So this is what the handout looks like. And so if you're actually just loading it on your computer, these are links that you can click on. So you can click on this one and it takes you to the Google map. And you can click on this one and it takes you to the Survey Monkey survey. We really strongly recommend that you take the survey on your desktop computer or your laptop. We found that just with uh, all the graphics that are involved, that it's much better to look at it on your computer. Now, here are, we realize these are some long links. So for the interactive map and for the survey, the survey one is a bit easier to follow. So we'll leave it uh, up for just a couple of minutes, but we strongly recommend downloading 
this guide and clicking on the links through that. And the city can also publish the interactive map and the survey links on monterey.org slash planning. And just reminding the audience that you can ask a question at any time. Okay, we haven't received any additional questions. Let's give it another minute or so. I want to thank the audience member who, who reminded us that Marina did choose managed retreat. There was actually a um, really interesting article about that quite recently. Um, want to say it was in the San Francisco Chronicle, but I could be wrong. Um, I'm actually going to look it up. Uh, LA Times, actually, the article I read um, about uh, the Marina's choice to go for, for managed retreat rather than protection was uh, February 24th of this year in the LA Times. But if you Google, you'll find um, a few other articles as well. So thank you for, for reminding us of that. Fantastic. Uh, Kim, do you have any closing remarks before we end the webinar? just really want to thank everybody for tuning in this evening. Um, we're really excited to receive your input and your ideas. Um, so I can't emphasize enough, um, please fill out the Survey Monkey um, document. If any of your friends were not able to um, listen to information is on our website, fill out the survey. So thank you so much for and we're happy to excited about your answer. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. And just reminding everyone that tonight's meeting was recorded and will be available later if you had to step away. And on top of that too, we'll be publishing all of the documents and handouts that you saw tonight. So thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank you. Bye.